Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three great resources for any kind of fairy tale campaign where you can run these things straight up or just take from them as you want. Um, when I say fairy tale, of course, I mean Dolmenwood. <laughs> I have Dolmenwood on the mind right now. And I have these three books that I thought, these three PDFs that I thought were all great in that regard. Now, The Black Worm of Brandon's Fur, which is one that a lot of people have seen before, is a great little short adventure. Setting, really, is what you're looking at with a bunch of lo adventure locations and connections and things like that. It's a great adventure. The second thing I'm going to be looking at is The Northern Tier, which is a hex crawl for swords and wizards in the Highlands, which is sort of a take on swords and wizardry. It's an old school uh, game. It is really cool. I, I had not come across this. Well, I downloaded this a while ago, and I've looked through it and just thought it was really, really cool, but only very recently did I really start to like consider how I might use it. And of course, my mind went straight to Dolmenwood. It's a great adventure once you guys see it. It makes great use of public domain art, and the ideas in this hex crawl are awesome. And then finally, I'll look at Rackham Vale, which is the paint box edition, which came out a few years ago and is just a fantasy adventure from the art of Arthur Rackham. I mean, if you know Arthur Rackham, you'll know that this is just pure fairy tale whimsy. Now, as you'll see, I'm actually not a huge fan of Rackham Vale as is. I, I just, well, we'll get into it when I get to it, but uh, I really like a lot of the ideas from it that you can take, even if you don't run it straight up. Um, so let's start with the Black Worm of Brandonsford. This PDF is by far the shortest. It's only 19 pages. And uh, it's all by Chance Dudenak, I think is how you say his name. There's some artwork from the public domain. For the most part, though, this is uh, all original work. Great region right here. A <laughs> nice little scale. It's given in inches rather than in hexes or in like a point crawl sort of idea, which is fine. It would have been cool to have a little point crawl set up for this or something like that, but it's really not a big deal, obviously. But you'll see that everything is given in very generic terms. The Barrow Mound, the Goblin Castle, the Dragon Lair, the Dwarves Mine, the Giant's House, the Witch of the Wood, the Fawn's Grove, the Destroyed Caravan. Um, and that's the sort of adventure you're getting here. Fairy tale, and again, I say generic, but not in a negative way. Generic fairy tale, where you have a dragon, and you have fairies, and you have a witch, and you have a giant, and you have goblins, and a very cool little region. I took a lot of these ideas and put them into my West Marches sort of fairy tale forest that I had, and it was great, especially the dragon, which is a really cool take on a dragon. Um, as it says right away, a family of dwarven brothers once lived in a cottage in the woods, leading simple lives mining under a hill. That is, until they came across a stash of buried treasure several weeks ago. One of the dwarves became so consumed by his greed that he killed his brothers to take it all for himself. His terrible greed transformed him into a dragon. The fearsome dragon terrorized the townsfolk, townspeople and slaughtered all but one of the hunters sent to kill it. Now no one in Brandonsford dares leave the town's walls. A great overall kind of danger in the background of this adventure. A thousand gold pieces to go hunt and kill the dragon. That's a great idea. There's a lot of uh, rumors or D8 table of rumors. Most of them are true. A couple of them are false. A few of them are false. Um, again, I've talked about this before where I don't really like... Uh, <laughs> necessarily just straight up false rumors unless they tell you something about the world in an interesting way. So, you know, I don't, I'm not sure about just, just simply false rumors that are false, but if they, if they kind of lead you into the world or if they're presented in such a way that the players have a reasonable reason to think that they're false, I, I don't mind that so much. One of the highlights of the, of the adventure, in my opinion, is the town itself. The people are great. Lady Hilda, uh, Malzazarik the Magnificent, which is a great name for a wizard, right? <laughs> Drop Dead Ned, a chaotic thief. Uh, really great um, NPCs that you find. Uh, Squints, of course. Squints the Halfling. Uh, these are recruitable characters that the party could, could take from the town. Quinn, the owner of the Golden Egg Tavern. Cedric, Eric, Warwick, George, Father William, Ingrid, and Farmer Gill. Each of them has some reason to be kind of interesting. You know, they have what they sell or what they do, a problem that they might have, what they can offer. There are various things that make them interesting in town, and, and they're all very, well, I think, they're, I think they're charming. I really like them. Here are a few kind of quests or things that you have going around. There's the fairy visitor, the missing booze, and then you get the woods itself with the D12 random encounter table. But this is, by the way, for being an X systems. It's an old school game. You can tell that with the stat blocks there. Very straightforward, very easy in that old school uh, design. 
The dragon itself, the beast, moves like a fat alligator, dragging his bloated belly along the ground with each lumbering step, but with the potential to strike in an instant. So the sorts of encounters you're running into here are like Nixie traders, leprechaun fishermen, goblins, but kind of fairy tale goblins rather than D&D 5e goblins or something like that. And so you definitely find this as much more of a fairy tale adventure, which is why you can plunder it for a Dolmenwood game or something like that. You could put uh, Brandon's Fur to sort of a, maybe a nearby forest or a, or a town near, near to the forest of Dolmenwood, such that it has influence from the fairies and stuff like that, but it's not as fairy tale-esque as Dolmenwood itself. Or you could just take some of the ideas out of it and put it into your game. You have locations here like the Dwarves Mine, the Dragon Lair, the Goblin Castle. The Goblin is kind of like a pig goblin, which is an interesting way of doing it. Hogboon, the Goblin King. And uh, his, his Emerald Ring is hilarious. It uh, can change a non-living, non-magical object into a plant or transform a changed object back. That's his power. He can turn anything, a non-living, non-magical object into a plant. One of the things that he can do. That's great. Um, the Barrow Mound, which has you know, got goblins and gray oozes inside it, along with Sir Alfred, who's an undead knight. Sir Willet's skull. A floating skull, veiny yellow eyes, bounce around in their sockets, always laughing. That seems like something out of a, an 80s, 70s fantasy cartoon or something like that. I don't know, it just sounds like it, the last unicorn or something with that skeleton. I don't know why. You get a giant rat down there, giant spider, Sir Mirrodin's ghost. Again, we're not looking at anything that's like crazy weird here. It's definitely in the vein of fairy tale, but very delightful, charmingly done, and, and, and good maps and stuff at the end. Uh, Well-designed dungeons and some cool magic items. That is the Black Worm of Brandonsford. Now, uh, again, I think a lot of people have looked at this one before. It's a great adventure, but it's just one of those things that I saw and I was like, yep, that's great for Dolmenwood. So <laughs> I, had my, I, I, I recommend you guys check it out. The next thing that I wanted to look at is really cool. It's 147 pages, the Northern Tier. It is all, as far as I can tell, by the work of W.R. Beatty. And there's some public domain maps and art, uh, but it's a lot of work, a lot of writing. And the composition of this book is really good. I mean, the, the, the public domain art has been worked into it in a really good way that feels very natural. It doesn't feel like a lot of public domain art often feels when it's put into a book where it's kind of like squished in there and doesn't necessarily fit the tone of what's being described. This really does because it's more fairy tale like and because it's more, I don't know, evocative in its, in its prose, it fits with the maybe more high grand medieval fairy tale art that is used from a lot of the sources that it draws from. I like it quite a lot. So the book is a hex crawl, which means you get a bunch of random encounters, and then you get a bunch of hex descriptions and then appendices on magic items and creatures you might find there. Now, it's worth noting that this guy has a whole setting that he's developed with a whole bunch of different PDFs you can get on DriveThruRPG. Most of them cost maybe like 2 to $5. They're not that expensive. But then there's a bunch of free ones or pay-what-you-want ones that you can get as well. Maps and uh, player maps and GM maps, and uh, there's a bestiary on there, which is free. Uh, and just going through and getting a sense of you know what he's, what he's doing on there. Um, one of the things I love about this book, and you'll see it right away, are the encounters. The random encounter tables are all, maybe not all amazing, but they are mostly really flavorful and cool. You're not running into, I mean, you can draw from the really cool ones, I would say, and, and there's a lot of great ones. So there's the Abbot Darmas of St. Alvaren's Monastery. The Abbot, the Abbot, see Hex 28 for the monastery, is traveling with D4 cloistered brethren and D6 lay brethren, as well as D6 hired men-at-arms. The Abbot travels in a small carriage, and the men-at-arms ride horses or donkeys of a long griffin way while the brothers walk. Then you have who he is and what he is, and who he's traveling with. D6, the heart of an umber hulk in the eyes of a griffin, or the church tax for the high king, 12,000 silver pieces and 400 gold piece rubies, or the book of true life, a magical tome that teaches the truths of resurrection. Reading it removes the system shock rolls or other penalties from any such spells. His mistress, Tiaran, in the guise of a lay brother. Everyone in the abbot's party knows who she is and disapproves. So that's just the random encounter you might run into. There's nothing more to it than that, unless you want to make more to it than that. But of course, the abbot is from a particular hex, and so there's going to be stuff going on in that hex that would make it more of an interesting encounter if you know about it, and all that stuff. Might be an introduction to what's going on in the hex, and all of that. Then you get Alan the Mighty, the Mouse, and the Winged Champion. This is straight out of Lady Hawk, but with a twist. If you guys know Lady Hawk, the movie with um, Roger Hauer and uh, Matthew Broderick, Michelle Pfeiffer. It's a great movie. <laughs> but it's sort of a take on Lady Hawk. 
This mysterious man has been stalking the northern tier, seeking injustices to right and oppressed uh, to free. He wears bright white plate armor and wields a shield painted in gold with a stylized sun and a magic sword, Chaos Bane. Rumor has it, Alan can summon a dragon. In truth, the mouse can polymorph into a small white dragon. He's got uh, an enormous hawk, which he calls Champion. So it's a dude and a hawk and a sidekick named Mouse. But the, ha um, the hawk doesn't transform. It is the, uh, it's the mouse that does. So then you can run into the, the Envoy of the Silver Queen, Fiannon, the Forest Master, Goran, the Wild Man, the Hag of the Deep Grove. Just really flavorful encounters. Hargeth, the Hedge Wizard, Mad Agatha, Stefan Carrion Tinker, the Witch of the West Wind. Now there's a whole bunch of mundane encounters, and they're, you know, relatively boring, but if you look at the people encounters, they're actually kind of interesting. A little girl lost, a tinker, a deluded wandering knight, an old man, a bandit scout, a wandering beggar, a false pilgrim, a noble in disguise. That's cool. And then the creatures you're running into are much more grounded and realistic. A deer, moose, rabbit, quail, pheasant, grouse, ground bird, lynx. You're not really running into goblins and ogres. If you're going to run into a creature that's a fight or something, it's going to be a named creature. It's going to be an encounter like that. Now you have some mundane weather encounters and mundane special encounters, and they're kind of cool. They're mundane, but they're things like a seemingly crazed man leaps out of cover, brush behind a boulder, etc., brandishing a branch as a sword and wearing a turtle shell as a helmet and a breastplate of woven corn stalks or some other plant. So it's it's mundane. It's not magical. It's not fairy. It's not you know monstrous, but it's interesting. It's kind of a fun encounter. And that's what all of these basically are. Then you get some dangerous encounters, and these ones are much more what you would expect, right? Onkegs, gnolls, a forsaken one named Winyard, if killed, treat as no encounter from that point on, goblin raiding parties, long arms, griffins, that sort of thing, with forest hill and cleared hexes and then mountain hexes. And you get a description of each of these encounters, what the onkeg does, what the bee here does, the coyotes do, the eagle's giant do, the gabbler. It's really interesting. Then you get Saint Ashar's Stallion. That's a cool little picture, but, but you get the special encounters, what I was going to say. <laughs> you get the special encounters. These are, it's a 3D10 table, so it's curved. It means you're much less likely to get the Hermit and the Woman and the Procession of the Twelve Widows, right, than you are to get something in the middle. But these are really, really cool. This is where this book really shines. The Hermit and the Woman. A really cool encounter here. What the Beneficent Prophecies are, if it's between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., and what the Malevolent Prophecies are, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., with just what they what they are, <laughs> a peasant cart, another kind of interesting magical thing that you can run into, the white lady and the black knight. Let me read this: A woman dressed all in white, riding a pure white, almost glowing horse, is riding next to a figure dressed in black plate mail, riding a jet black horse. The woman is the white lady, and the man is the black avenger. The white lady is the spirit of one of the virgin princesses of Urtan, killed on her wedding night by the huntsman of the queen of the night. When the white lady appears, the locals say misery follows. The White Lady is a specter caught in unlife by the power of the injustice of her life and death. She will question any living being she encounters, asking before questions, seeking to catch the living beings in a lie. She will stop asking after a maximum of four questions, or when the question lies to her. If questions are answered honestly, the Lady and the Avenger fade away. If anyone does lie to her, she commands the Avenger to attack while she will watch from the side. If the White Lady is attacked, she will fight fiercely. The Black Avenger is Zealous Defender, a new type of undead caught in eternal unlife by a vow taken to forever protect his Lady. He taunts his opponents and will fight to the death unless his opponents flee. He will not pursue. He can use the sword's powers to find hidden opponents or use bl or to blink to gain an advantage. If the White Lady takes any damage, the Black Avenger will fly into a rage, attacking with a bonus of plus two to hit and damage, but a penalty of three points to his AC. He will defend the White Lady with his last action if necessary. If the Avenger is killed, the horse and armor will evaporate into black smoke, leaving behind a magical sword, black steel, silk-wrapped hilt, etched with roses, tiny rose-shaped ruby and hilt. Avenger's Wrath, sword plus one, plus two versus humans, minus two versus undead. Detect living three times per day, allows the user to blink per the spell at eighth level three times per day, a neutral evil sword. If the White Lady is killed, she and her horse evaporate in a cloud of white smoke, leaving behind a crown of star flower blossoms and her voice echoing a curse. The crown of blossoms is the virgin's crown, imbuing the wearer with the ESP, the ability to regenerate one hit point per turn as a vampiric touch, and it acts in all ways as a ring of protection plus two. This is a lawful evil item. Now with the pages, or that they're hit points, excuse me, hit points 27 and hit points 53. And then the, the D10 table for the question that she asks, a D10 table for the curse that she can inflict, and a D10 table for the Black Avengers taunt. That's super cool. Great encounter, really flavorful, really feels like that fairy tale sort of, t maybe Arthurian saga perhaps, but on the fairy tale side of things. I really like it. And all of these adventures are kind of like that. 
The monks of the Fallen Fire are kind of silly. They're fake monks that are actually bandits, but they have this charm that's causing this chaotic, event, uh, different random chaotic effects to happen all around them. And they really don't want these things to happen. They're not sure exactly why they're happening. It's kind of funny. Mother Sacrin and her hovel. The boy who dug 15 graves. This one's kind of creepy. The Welwa, the bear friend, the mad hermit, old white beard, the fairy box, the hooded wanderer, Dorkan, the man collector, wandering Jack, ugly Karas, pitch wanderer, Fritz and his friends, Finn the tiny, bear skin, the frog king, the night claw, foreign and dimer, little children lost, the seven brothers and their true forms, the seed oak, the brute, the crow, procession of twelve widows. Great encounter, super flavorful. All of them are really fairy tale, and you just add them into your game. Add any one of them into your game as a local legend or as something the players can run into. It'd be so cool, so flavorful, and it would really bring them into a particular type of world. Then you get the hex crawl key. So this is a hex crawl, obviously, and there's a map for it at the end, and you can get the map separately. But you get, uh, you know, what's actually going here? There's a be here's layer, a be here's layer. I don't know if it's be here or be here. I don't really know. Be here actually sounds better. But the Bahir, uh, it will not attack an obviously powerful group, especially if they have horses. Simple hole in the ground, but then you get that. So then there's a woodsman's clearing with the envoys of the Gnome King, an old king's watchtower, which is really cool. Uh, it's a small dungeon, but it's, it's very small. The grave of the five champions of St. Turius with an entrance. The poison tree, the fisherman of Bohecht. Bohecht, great piece of public domain art there. The Hobbled Guardian, that's such a cool one. The cave is the lair of a sphinx named Siala. The creature typically lurks behind the stone above her cave opening, waiting to ambush any prey that comes to investigate the bones or the cave entrance. If anyone approaches, she will roar and leap above the cave entrance as a show of force. She will threaten and boast about her ability to kill interlopers, but she will not immediately attack. In fact, Siala has a problem. The harpies, who she calls the she-devils of the mountain, who are nesting in the northern part of the hex, have to entrap the sphinx with a magical chain, the bindings of the ancients anchored some 55 feet behind the entrance to her lair. Really interesting little encounter there, with some treasure and unique items you can find. Hanging Goblin Wood, Hargeth's Temple, Woodbridge, Shrine of the Fallen Angels. This is really cool. This uh, the, the idea here is that um, the Divine will hear anyone who offers prayers from this shrine, or at least that's the rumor. But it's a Shrine of Fallen Angels, sounds pretty creepy. Boat Ruins, the Drowning Pool, Chapel in the Woods, a very fairy tale. The Rat Tree, the Heart of the Wood, Cave Bear Caves, the Witch of the Wilderness, the great piece of art there. Really cool. Different hag skulls you can find. <laughs> it's really cool. Garus Man, Fallen Village in the Tumble. It's a cool little uh, village and monastery. It's kind of creepy there. The Hall of the Gnome King, which is uh, uh, essentially it's sort of an exiled fairy lord who now lives here. Great piece of art there. The Watchers in the Woods, St. Alburn's Hunting Lodge, and the Hunting Monks, with their name and what they can do. The Tar Pits of Harasal. Oh, really another great piece of public domain art there. Woodland Marsh of the Evil Druid. Crater Stone, Hamlet's Old King's Watch, the Brothers Five, Abandoned Temple of the Sun, the Rusted Tomb, Rebel Trees. Oh, that's great. Fourth Watch Beacon, the Burnt Forest. I mean, just so many hexes that you can look into. That's a great one. The Hanging Knights. This is a really creepy one. The wooded portion of this hex is haunted by a dozen unique undead creatures. In a lightly wooded patch, the exact location seems to change from time to time as the story is told, are hanging the corpses of 11 armored knights and their weapons and shields, dangling on the end of heavy chains swaying in the breeze. On the ground beneath this macabre sight is the crumpled body of a twelfth knight. If any of the corpses or their gear is touched, or are touched, the knight on the ground will rise up slowly, staggering and halting. The eyes and the rotted face beneath the visor will look over the interlopers in the area for another round or two, then speak with a raspy voice asking what their business is. If their response is aggressive or off-putting, the knight will cock his head and ear will fall off. Whatever their response, he will then ask another question. See the chart. In many ways, the creature is simply looking for his adversary to fail at a query so he can call his brother to join in battle, but reasonable answers are accepted. After two queries, the undead knight will nod curtly, sway for a moment, and collapse in a heap. Touching any of the corpses, including the one on the ground, begins the questioning process all over again. If incited to battle, the eleven hanging knights will take a round to drop to the ground, drawing weapons. They lose initiative on the subsequent round as well, acting on last in the round. These are the sons of Boahecht. See Hex 3 for more information about their brothers and Boahecht himself. Killed by their brothers in a feud over birthright. They are cursed in their own life to haunt this region of the northern tier, challenging any stranger or lost villager who has the misfortune to stray into their presence. 
Evidence of the deaths of their brothers, such as the presence of the sword sky splitter or one or more of the fishermen of Bohex knives, will cause the hanging knights to all begin to sway slightly. Then their spirits will leave their bodies, leaving behind 12 sets of full plate. Each has a 75% chance of being damaged. If damaged, one minor damage, two serious damage, three heavy damage, four irreparable, irreparable damage. Nine shields, 12 long swords, one of which is a pale imitation of sky splitter called night splitter. Sword plus one, plus two versus sky creatures, and additional d4 electrical damage three times per day. The hanging knights do not pursue their quarry uh, beyond the bounds of this hex. This, this hex, excuse me. And then you have their question and additional treasure you can find in the region. That's a super cool hex, right? You put that in your game and it's so flavorful. It brings you right into that, again, fairy tale with a darkness, a little bit of whimsy, ridiculousness, but that darkness is certainly present. The Griffin Lair, the Summer Court of the Silver Queen, St. Alberon's Monastery, a whole bunch of room descriptions for that place. The Girl at the Mouth of Madness. There's a Dust Lich there. And an Angel, a Principality. Tiresh Village. Uh, one of the locations here, the Amartan Copper Mine, Dragon's Grave, Arch, Madagartha, or Agatha, excuse me, and Haggath's Hargath's Keep, Hargath's Folly, the Four Willow Wheels. And again, you just have hex after hex of great, flavorful locations that really, really draw you into that one particular vibe. Now, there's a license here, the Chantry of the Eplane, but then you immediately go into the appendix. So you have the appendix of new items with some really cool magic items here. And again, they're not just like a plus one weapon. It's like, if it's a plus one weapon, it's a plus one weapon with something cool about it. Uh, like the Circlet of Champions, the Circlet of the Champions of St. Turius. These eight inch diameter steel rings are rather unremarkable. If placed on the head and a successful save versus magic is made, the wearer may control the skeletal warrior linked to the individual circlet. A failed save means the wearer falls under the control of the skeletal warrior. That's in Hex 3A. It's super cool. Lots of great magical items. Lots of great magical items. Then you get weather. Uh, adventurers in the northern tier and determine where the party is and then you have you know uh, alternative things a, an appendix of rumors this is really cool too because it says if you're just talking to like local villagers just roll a d20 because those are all kind of like local or like lo low scale rumors but it's a d100 table and then there's a for each entry there are sub tables that you can roll on or there's a d6 table i think for each of these yeah d6 for each of them an appendix for NPC statistics. Very simple. Very simple, as you can see, for all the different creatures here. And then there are maps of the northern tier. Various locations, all, seem, all seemingly hand-drawn by the creator himself. Really, really, really wonderful. The northern tier. I highly recommend this. Now, again, there are separately available locations in this region. Uh, the Chantry of the Deep Flame, the Ghost Downs, Hall of the Gnome King, etc. So there, there's details of each of these places. This is just the overview, but a really good overview. I highly recommend the Northern Tier, just to check out if you're interested in... I mean, it's so flavorful, right? It's so flavorful. And uh, as you guys saw, the use of public domain art is really well executed. It's more, it's, it's better executed here than I, I think I've almost seen almost anywhere else. Um, on that note, we get Rackham Vale, which is obviously full of the... Uh, artwork of Arthur Rackham, which is now in the public domain. This is a very fantastic uh, product for a number of reasons. The art, Arthur Rackham is one of my favorites. I absolutely love the art. On the other hand, the writing of this book is a little bit less exciting to me. I'm not as interested in the, what they've done with the world. There are a couple, really, not a couple, there are a lot of really good things, but I, I'm not really interested in running this as a setting. Just the overall the overall execution of this valley, Rackham Vale itself, feels a little haphazard to me. But there are so many good ideas here. So many good ideas. Uh, it's hard to not recommend this book, especially if you're interested in, first of all, the art of, art of Arthur Rackham. Uh, the art of, of Arthur Rackham. There we go. The art of Arthur Rackham. I can say it. Um, or the sort of fairy tale vibe. And if you're going to be running a Dolmenwood campaign, which I am at some point, then this is a great book to have for all the ideas that you can add in it, seal from it, and put into that campaign. But it's a full setting. It's a full-on setting. What's not in this... I'm, I'm glad it has this. So what's in this and what's not in this? Oh, look at that art. I mean, it's great. Arthur Rackham is just so fantastic. The key features of the Vale. It's got a cool map. I actually have the physical version of this, and it has a nice cloth map that comes with it. I like that a lot. Great, beautiful art here. The Golden River and what's... You, know, you can run into it there. Oh, it's another absolutely beautiful piece of art. This whole book is just full of this stuff. Again, it's one of the reasons why I love this so much. Even if you don't like the setting, Rackham Vale is a gorgeous book. That's just because, really, the art of Arthur Rackham is incredible. The Vale High Road. 
it's a it's a it's a region, so you get a lot of different places here. Uh, and I like the layout, who or what is there, and what's interesting about it. That's a really cool idea. And then you get encounters and motivations for that individual location. That's really cool. So every location is laid out in such a way that you know who's there, and at a glance, what's interesting about it, at least according to the writer. Of course, you could come up with your own interesting things as well, but that's just you know, at a glance what's already there. And I love the idea that you have these encounters and motivations that are separate, so you have both of those going uh, for each, each location. Really, really great. Now, again, it's one of those things where you just want to kind of take uh, the bits that you like and leave the rest. There might be stuff you don't like here. It might be, uh, yeah, overall, I wouldn't really run this as a setting, just because, again, I don't necessarily like the overall effect of all of this stuff together. It's not bad, it's just not my preference. What I really like, though, are a lot of these individual ideas, especially when we get to the bestiary. The creatures in this book are awesome, and it would be fairly easy to take them and to transplant them directly into any campaign, but especially a Dolmenwood campaign. Any campaign where you have a more fairy tale vibe. And, and you know, fairy tale is kind of an interesting, a hard thing sometimes to get right, because you have to have that mix of whimsy, logic, ir illogic, right? I mean, un unlogic, non-logic, fairies have their own rules, and you have to get that right. It can't be arbitrary, but it has to kind of be arbitrary. The faction table is kind of cool. You get to see how people connect. It's a, a little bit actually less clear than it could have been, just because, I don't know, the, the way it's actually executed, it's less clear to me than, but, you know, a little bit of study of this for a couple couple minutes and you got it down. But it's, it's not like, oh, at a glance, I obviously see how the whole thing connects, especially since it's on those two pages there. A two-page spread, or a... a, a, a What's the word I'm looking for? A console, uh, two pages up at a time would make it a lot easier to see. I love that picture, though. I love that picture. Adventure hooks. This is cool. I really like this portion of the book. A bunch of uh, adventure hooks for the different kinds of creatures. Creature-specific adventure hooks. That's a great idea. And then the bestiary itself. And the bestiary is in, like the best part of this book. Umbrella the spook. The damsel in distress. This damsel, excuse me, of distress. Duppy caps. Duppy husks. Envines. Feral owls. Now, what's cool about this is you have how to roleplay them, and this is just an example. Every creature seems to have something like this. You have a roleplaying section, you have a what they are, what they like, what they hate, what they want, their allies, their enemies, and then their stats with their abilities for every creature. Really, really, really cool. That means you can just pick one of these and suddenly you have a whole bunch of information about them and how it works. Gorkle Trees, the King of the Golden River. The Leviathan, it's a great creature. <laughs> a snack for later, that's a great one. Nimberlangles. Post, yeah, the No Moon Crone. Forms taken by the No Moon Crone based on the time of based on the moon, whether it's daytime, nighttime, whether there's a solar eclipse, whatever it might be. She has a different form. Plagi oh, Plagus Dimrels, don't say that. But anyway, these are absolutely awesome. Great pieces of art with great creatures. Oh, there's the Questing Beast. Lonely are the geeses of the Questing Beast. Such a beautiful picture. Root Trolls. Serpent Tangle, the Slaver Kirill Nang. So just absolutely great, 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 great creatures, pieces of art, and um, ideas to generate from those creatures. So if you're running a fairy tale game, Rackham Vale is so useful, so useful. Plus a bunch of these locations. All right, so I'll go back to the beginning. Tables for creating settlements and creatures. Mortal sites and settlements. What is it? Who is here? What's interesting about it? Face sites and settlements, who is here? What's interesting about it? Creatures. And then you get the uh, uh, extra stuff at the end about Arthur Rackham. And an expanded bestiary, which is always cool. And you get some dungeons in the back, some pre-made dungeons for you. The Alchemist's Tower, that's a great dungeon. Put that into any game. The Copper Mine, which is a place you can go to. Kind of a complicated map, but not too bad. You can, you can figure it out after a little while. The Old Keep, that's a great one. Great map there. And a key to it. 
the old keep, the great hall, which is a particular submap for it. And then magic items, which these are awesome too. Excellent, excellent, excellent special magic items. You're not looking at just boring, boring things. So like the Whirl Barrow, a tempestuous transporter. Really cool stuff. There's a calendar at the very end and then this back page uh, for the back page information. So all three of these products are great. Arthur Rackham, one of my favorite artists in that, in the, in, yeah, one of my favorite artists, period, I think. And that uh, the art from this book is so good. As a whole, it's not my favorite setting, but the creatures from it, the magic items for it, and the tables for creating your own locations are really excellent. And there's a lot of good ideas in the locations themselves. The Northern Tier is fantastic, and I just don't think it has enough attention. It's such a great setting. Uh, I highly recommend checking it out. And then, of course, the Black Worm of Brandonsford, an excellent adventure setting. Uh, you could run a much shorter campaign here, much shorter, few adventure, few session adventure here, and it would work out really, really well. All right, guys. Well, I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you in another video.